Dear guests, honored Prime Minister, and everyone following us via the live stream. My name is Karen Spence, and I'm honored to welcome all of you to BI Norwegian Business School. It's so great to see so many people here today engaging in such an important topic. BI is an ambitious business school, and today's agenda is certainly equally, if not more, ambitious. In the next hour, we will highlight five extraordinary turnarounds to save the world. Working together, an international team of scientists and experts, including two of our colleagues here from BI, have discovered that there is still time to fix what needs fixing in our society. In their new book, Earth for All, they provide a survival guide for humanity and a framework for how we can succeed with a more fair, just, and affordable economic transformation. So today, we will discuss how we can make this giant leap. And we will also look at the is issue from a Norwegian and a Scandinavian perspective. And I am now very happy to introduce our first speaker. He's a psychologist, a TED global speaker, and part of our school's Center for Sustainability and Energy. He also teaches our students and on topics including sustainability and green growth. He's here to tell us more about the problem and how we can solve it. So please, everyone, give a big hand for Per Espen Stocknes. Welcome. <laughs> So thank you for that, and uh, thank you for being here, and a uh, special thank you to Jonas, uh, our new book, Earth for All, um, explores the long-term situation for humanity in this century. We do start our new book, which is also out in German, and very soon in Italian, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese. We start on recognition that everyone now knows we have a climate crisis on our hands. And there is, on top of that, a nature crisis with devastating loss of wildlife. And there is a nutrient crisis in waterways and coastal systems. And people know we also have an inequality crisis where a lucky few play golf while the others live in shanty towns. On top of that, we've just been through a pandemic that made all of those four worse, and particularly inequality over the last two years, setting nations back and poverty back with at least six years. And on top of that, we know it is the high-income countries that are responsible for the largest footprints. So we are in an intertwined and wicked problem where nature emergencies worsen the social post-pandemic, high inflation and inequality emergencies, as we've seen in India and Pakistan just recently. So if we continue with global decision-making, as usual, as we've done over the last 40 years, half-hearted attempts at sustainability, then inequality will get even worse to 2050. We may have a rise in global GDP for some years, but the long-term human average well-being will decline. And we call this the too little, too late scenario. In the Earth for All project, we built a model and we've explored an integrated systemic solution. It consists of five extraordinary turnarounds that break with historic trends and creates a giant leap for humanity. If implemented quickly, the five will lead to real systems change and a rising well-being for most of the world the four billion who live on less than $2 a day. Incredibly, only two to 4% of global GDP needs to be reallocated to solve it. And the interlinked five turnarounds are, one, ending poverty by reforming the international financial system and trade regulations to support policy space for low-income countries. Two, 
addressing gross inequality, government should increase taxes, in both on income and wealth, on the 10% top incomes, until they take less than 40% of national incomes. Three, empowering women. Introducing gender equity in terms of agency, rights, resources, and power in both law and employment. Four, making our food system healthy for people and ecosystems by transforming the food system towards regenerative and sustainable agriculture, providing healthy diets for people without destroying the planet. This will halt biodiversity loss and protect nature and people's health. Five, transitioning to clean energy. That is, transforming our inefficient fossil, fossil energy system to a clean and optimized energy system, reaching 50% cuts in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and net zero carbon and biodiversity loss by 2050, which will provide sustainable energy for all. Now, many of these actions are, however, a little more a more, little bit more costly in the short term than continuing with business as usual. Hence, they will not happen all by themselves, by market dynamics alone. Therefore, we do need a more active state in order to get higher taxes on the top 10% to regulate away wastefulness, new institutions for addressing inequality, and so on. So collective action is needed on top of innovation and market dynamics, because individual action and green market innovations are, as we have seen over the last 40 years, very helpful, but insufficient to achieve the speed of systems change needed. So hence, the real challenge going forwards is to build support, public support, for an active entrepreneurial state and collective action on gender equality, food and energy, financed by higher taxes on the insanely rich. This will create a giant leap, particularly for a new growth model in the poor and low-income countries. This is where most of the world lives on insufficient incomes for a dignified life. One of our co-authors in Earth for All is Jayati Ghosh, who is a professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts, and we're appointed to the World Health Organization's Council for the Economics of Health for All. She also sits on the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism, mandated to providing a vision for international cooperation. And Gosh is the co author of Earth for All, a survival guide for humanity. Let's bring on Jayati Gosh video. It's often presented in a very polarized fashion that the issues of sustainability and ecological concerns and the, the problems of climate change and global warming are really those that are entirely the responsibility of the global north. And that asking developing countries to take immediate and strong measures is against their interests because they won't be able to develop. This is completely wrong. Because in fact, it is true that there is a very large historical debt owed by the rich countries, which have contributed to about 80%, 85% of global carbon emissions. It is also true they have a very big responsibility in terms of making available finance and technology to deal with the problem. But in the developing world, it is absolutely essential that we embark on a different growth strategy, a different pattern of development that does not demolish the Earth's resources, that does not lead to ecological destruction, that does not add to the problems of carbon emissions and climate change. And it's possible. We have the knowledge. Globally, we have the resources. It is therefore essential, and that's why our book makes it clear, that we have to focus on reducing and eliminating poverty and dramatically reducing inequality, because these are really the things that are standing in the way of our achieving a sustainable future. And it's possible in many ways. It's possible if we grow for if we go for a green growth strategy that actually ensures basic needs for our people in a sustainable way, using new 
energy, using different forms of energy, changing the patterns of food consumption and production, changing the patterns of habitation so that we are able to live in a more sustainable way and improve our quality of life as well. So that means an emphasis on ensuring that everybody has a decent life, on recognizing care work, uh, including the unpaid and underpaid care work, making sure that all care workers are rewarded and remunerated adequately, making sure that everyone has access to reasonably decent levels of life in terms of housing, in terms of health and education, in terms of basic nutrition, which is good quality nutrition. And this means we have to reduce inequality, which is an, a major turnaround that we have talked about as well. We know that the top 10% uh, of the world is responsible for more than half of global emissions. And we know that they are increasing their emissions, unlike the rest of the population. So we have to operate to reduce inequalities of both assets and incomes and of consumption and of carbon emissions. It's possible through regulation, through redistribution, through fiscal policies. And we have to ensure that the developing countries get adequate technology and access to finance to make sure that we can do this important turnaround. Thanks to Jayati Ghosh, um, crucial to understanding the poverty dynamic. And we will now turn towards the resource perspective. Is there enough resources for humanity to continue the type of trajectory we are looking at here? Anders Wiegmann is both a Swedish and European parliamentarian and also author. Wiegmann is an honorary president of the Club of Rome, as well as an honorary doctor at Linköping University, and a key member of the Earth for All Transformation Economics Commission. He's also chairman of the governing board of Climate Kick, and specializes on resource use in the world resource, uh, WR, I lost the word. IRP. I, <laughs> International Resource Panel. <clears throat> Please, thank, honor. thank you, Per Espen, Prime Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, glad to be here. Um, Earth for All is first and foremost about the five turnarounds that uh, Per Espen briefly told you about. Poverty, inequality, uh, gender empowerment or, or women's empowerment, uh, energy and food systems transformation. But of course, we need other complementing, uh, complementing and, and, and flanking measures. Uh, of particular importance will be to deal and address the increasingly, very rapidly increasing uh, demand for and use of natural resources. In particular in our part of the world, in the industrialized countries. When we talk about climate mitigation, we mostly talk about fossil fuels and to phase them out. And that is of course crucially important. But materials is the other side of the coin. And I'm a member of the International Resource Panel. And we had a big study in 2019 called Global Resources Outlook, where our estimate is that the extraction and processing of materials amount to more than 50% of global greenhouse emissions, in particular carbon emissions, and as much as 90% of biodiversity loss. Steel, concrete, plastics, aluminum make up 20% of global carbon emissions. Demand for materials have tripled since 1970. Here we talk about fossil fuels, biomass, minerals, and metals. If we do not change course, we will double again in the next 30 to 40 years. And to change course is not going to be easy, because we have calculated that the world will build as much urban infrastructure till 2050 as we have built hitherto. That's population growth, that's urbanization in low-income countries. And you know, if that happens with today's technologies and today's basic materials, we can forget about the Paris Agreement because all the carbon emissions from those materials will, will eat up the carbon budget still left for two degrees. Another problem is that material consumption is very unevenly, unevenly distributed. 
a person in Sweden or Norway, we have a carbon foot, uh, material footprint of roughly 25 tons per year. Somebody living south of Sahara in Africa has a material footprint of roughly two tons a year. And it's evident that to increase the standard of living for poor people, they need to increase their footprint. But if they would reach the level of our footprint, the planet couldn't cope. The resulting emission and waste would be colossal. And we would also have resource limits uh, in, in several areas. So hence the challenge is to lower material footprints among the rich and to increase among the poor. And how to do that is not easy. To make material consumption more efficient and also more equitable is one of the cross-cutting issues and primary issues in Earth for All. The energy turnaround is one example. Energy efficiency is key. The inequality turnaround is another example by taxing the rich, but also what we introduce is a basic univer universal basic dividend, which will also help the, the, the poor to increase their standard of living. Uh, in one of the deep dive papers that we uh, have, this that we have uh, written for in connection with the Earth for All, Janusz Potocznik and myself, we have looked into how we can make material consumption less wasteful and more efficient. And we have come to the conclusion that there are ample opportunities to do it. Food waste is one example. Going from linear to circular production models is another example. We normally use materials only once, which of course is a total waste. And the third one is of course to rethink how we organize, for instance, mobility in big cities. If we only replace combustion engines with electric vehicles, we haven't done the job right. We should design cities to be more comfortable and more easy for walking and biking. We should, of course, expand and make uh, public transport better. And we should offer mobility as a service. Those are just a few examples. So as you can see, we have an agenda to address material consumption. Uh, and I think some of the proposals we make are going to take us a big way. But ultimately, it's, of course, a question of what is quality of life. And quality of life is not only buying more stuff, material consumption. It is about so many other things. It's about health. It's about clean environment, decent jobs, culture, education, etc. And we try to initiate such a discussion by pointing our finger on the way we measure welfare and well-being. GDP growth is not a good measurement. We need well-being indicators. And by just addressing that this way, we also initiate a discussion about quality of life. It's going to be tough, but it's worth. Thank you, Anders. <laughs> and it's less tough if we can uh, finance it. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Jürgen Randers, who will highlight the financial perspective. He is a professor emeritus of climate strategy here at BI Norwegian Business School where he also previously served as the school's president. He has been the board chairman of three banks and have led the government commission on low emissions for Norway. And not least, 50 years ago, exactly, he was the main author, one of the main authors of the famous report Limits to Growth, 1972, and now also still going as the co-author of Earth for All, a survival guide for humanity. Jörgen. Ladies and gentlemen, so you have heard we have a problem. And you have also heard that there is a solution to the problem. The solution is to implement five turnarounds very quickly. Our book, Earth for All, also makes the very important assertion, statement, that the cost of doing so is not very high. That it will cost uh, of the order of 2 to 4% of the world's uh, GDP, which means moving 2 to 4% of labor and capital from dirty activities 
to green activities or clean activities or sustainable activities. This means to shift workers from building offshore platforms to building solar panels and windmills instead. So, when the solution is that simple and the cost is so low, why doesn't anything happen? The response, the global response, is very low and has been so during the 50 years I've been trying to work for a better world because of two reasons. First of all, what is needed to be done is not profitable from the point of view of the investor. And secondly, it is resisted by the incumbents, by the workers and the owners of those dirty activities that will be closed down or should be replaced with green alternatives. Luckily, the state can solve the problem by paying the bill. The state can subsidize investments so they become uh, profitable, and the state can pay workers' salaries while they are moved from the dirty to green sectors. So in my mind, the real problem, the real obstacle, is to find the money that would allow governments to pay for the transition from dirty to clean. And to do this in a manner which maintains support from a democratic majority of voters. So the real question then is, how can the state obtain amount, uh, funding that amounts to a couple of percent uh, of total income? In Norway, this amounts to of the order of 60 billion kroner per year. There are only three ways. The state can tax, the state can borrow, and the state can print money. Higher taxes will be opposed by the majority. Thus, Earth for All recommends that the tax increase must be focused on the rich. To have, as Per Espen said, the 10% richest pay the total cost of, of higher well-being for the majority. The 10% richest control 50% of global income and can easily pay the 2 to 4% that is the total cost of sustainability through corporate taxes. They will, of course, oppose, but they are, the rich are a minority. Increased long-term borrowing is the same as shifting the cost to future generations, to those who will benefit from cleaning up stuff. This was simple when interest rates were low, and probably is what will be done until higher government debt is no longer possible. The third option is to print money. That is, to ask the central bank uh, to supply the state with additional funds earmarked for green projects, repeating the green stimulus packages of the past, paying fresh money directly to those who work on unprofitable green projects. This is, of course, fiercely opposed by the conventional macroeconomic wisdom and in Norway by central bank legislation because of the threat to inflation. Here I beg to differ. The printing of 2% every year will not in itself cause unacceptable inflation, especially when the money is used, focused on those who become unemployed because of closure of dirty activity. In Norway, this would mean using pension fund money to pay the petroleum sector for building offshore wind, CCS, or blue hydrogen, those climate actions that are not profitable using conventional measures, but are the ones that are necessary in order to reduce our reliance on coal, oil, and gas. And this must be done at a scale which avoids unemployment when the demand for petroleum declines towards 2050. I believe 30 to 60 billion Norwegian kroner per year will do the trick, and that is the same as an annual drawdown of half a percent of the petroleum fund every year. Other nations would have to print money to do so. We can take it from the fund. In summary, 
If we really want to save the world, I believe printing money, earmarked for green activities, will be the best solution. And especially if we want to maintain democratic support for the activity. Thank you. And uh, today is uh, the UN Day, the United Nations Day, 24th of October, 2022. And uh, online now, I hope if the internet gods are with us, uh, Stephen Stone, who is the deputy director, imagine, well, of the economy division in the UN Environmental Programme. And during the 12 years he has served in the UN, Stone has helped to shape and incubate the Green Economy Initiative, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership, and the Partnership for Action on Green Economy. So Stephen, I hope you can hear me and the word is yours. Thank you very much, Per. Great to be with you today. I want to thank you very much for the invitation to join this very important event um, 50 years after the first Stockholm conference, which created UNEP, um, and 50 years after the first Club of Rome report. And Jorgen, it's it's truly a, a privilege to be on the same panel with you, and of course with Anders and others, and, and the Prime Minister, of course. So three messages on this UN Day. The first, we need a radical rethink of economics and finance, and we are getting it. Earth for All, Transformational Economics Commission, and many others are questioning the basic assumptions behind economics. Rethinking prosperity in a finite world, what does rational self-interest mean when we are so closely connected that our actions will have impacts on others? There are many examples out there. The UNEP's Green Economy Report, which I joined, uh, that was why I joined UNEP back in 2010. Uh, the UNEP inquiry into the design of a sustainable financial system. The Das Gupta Report, and the list goes on. We are in a moment of time where we are rethinking everything because we have to. Second message, change is possible. Think of the pandemic response, the fiscal measures, the medical innovation, the technological innovation, the lifestyle innovations. Everything changed because of necessity. And earlier this year at the UN Environment Assembly, March 2022, it was right after the invasion of Ukraine. And yet, and yet, in spite of all the division, Countries at UNEAS 5 actually agreed to a historic resolution to end plastic pollution. They came together and they said, we have to deal with this problem. Change is possible and it's necessary to create connected solutions for what are essentially interconnected problems. And there are other examples. I'm also thinking of the G20 presidency coming up, India. Prime Minister Modi has said, I want sustainable lifestyles to be a corner pin, a cornerstone of my G20 presidency, lifestyles for the environment. Third and last message, out of crisis, opportunity. It's a cliche, but think back to the birth of the UN. Why was the UN created? It was the worst humanitarian disaster in the 20th century the Bretton Woods Institution, everything was falling apart. We had colossal damage and that was when the UN was created. So the question for us is, can the triple planetary crisis or even the quadruple planetary crisis, Per, if we take some of the um, additional points you put in there, can it focus our minds? That's the question for us. Can it create that innovation in this, as a matter of necessity? As economist Mariana Mazakatu says, we need a mission economy. We have 10 years to turn it around. And there are many examples there as well. Ladies and gentlemen, on this UN day, let us think of what the UN is capable of at its best, the Paris Agreement, the SDGs, the Montreal Protocol, which solved the ozone problem 30 years ago. And now the plastics resolution. The UN at its best is a platform for serving countries to imagine, reimagine, create and implement connected solutions for what are essentially interconnected challenges and problems. And in this context, 
how to create prosperity for all on our tiny thriving planet, how to create an earth for all. After all, the earth is our common home. It's our only home. So it's time for us to figure out how to care for it and how to share for it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you very much, Stephen, and congratulations on the UN Day, and, and thanks for letting us know about UN's role in this important work. But right now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our final speaker here today. He's been the leader of the Norwegian Labour Party since 2014. He served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2005 to 2012, and as the Minister of Health from 2012 to 2013. And before this, he also served as the Secretary General of the Norwegian Red Cross. We are truly honored to have you back here at BI, this time to discuss with what the Norwegian and Scandinavian governments are doing to address these global issues. Prime Minister Jonas Gahr the stage is yours. Thank you, Rector, and congratulations for being a new rector of this fine institution. You gave a good summary of my CV, but it was not complete. <laughs> because my first job was awarded to me by Jürgen Randers back in 1986, when I was uh, joining a team uh, that uh, had the extraordinary foresight task of uh, envisaging Norway in the year 2000. That was a long time, <laughs> you know, but from 1986 to 2000, and we... Uh, embarked on, uh, I think, a big ID project. And Jürgen, you, was, you were one of the uh, uh, instigators of this, and I thank you for that. And it's, it's, I, I mention it because it is drawing on the same ID. Let's think big. Let us connect the dots. And I salute what you did back in 1972, Stockholm, for arranging the conference, Randers and the others for uh, arranging the Club of Rome, and all of you who really bring together these big dimensions that we need to look into. So you are inviting us into the big world. Let me invite you back to the small world, <laughs> which can be pretty complicated <laughs> as well, because it's our role really to connect these dots back into political deci decision making. And I must say, you know, let me be uh, personal for, for, for a, a moment here, that I recognize my political family in your five uh, dimensions, because they, these are qualities which I think each and one of them, not perhaps related, but each and one of them really inspired social democracy. How to fight poverty. It grew out of fighting poverty, this political movement. How to, how to fight inequality, gross inequality, and provide decency to people. How to secure women empowerment. It's a long line in a political struggle. And of course, food systems. How do you assure that people have decent food diets, and so on. And uh, uh, the uh, fundamental thing in economies, how to have an energy system that you can build on. So all of this, I, I, I can salute them. Now, I, can, I will not add something to each of them. So I will try to, to bring back some ideas in the nine minutes that I have been awarded. <laughs> but Per Espen, who was a dear <laughs> colleague in Parliament, and I must say, you know, I think Parliament really have great two losses now, me and you. Uh, <laughs> But, we, but we, are, we are delivering value where we are. You know, you at BI and I'm in the Prime Minister's office, so it's, it's okay. <laughs> but really, having you there, I think, really lifted debates. The key of the poverty dimension was lifted by Dr. Brundtland in her report. That report was named the Commission on Environment and Development, and the one could not be mentioned without the other. So without securing development, decent electricity, surviving people, you cannot put the climate dimension straight where it belongs. I remember a line working with Dr. Brundtland for so many years that we always refer to was the following. The Indian Prime Minister, and there have been a few since then, you could not tell the Indian Prime Minister that, sorry, we have filled up the waste baskets, there are no space left for you. The Indian Prime Minister would have to secure decency for his or her population. 
before moving forward. A lot can be said about Prime Minister Modi, but I think he is embarking on a pretty courageous agenda now of really making a change because he sees the light of the end of that poverty tunnel. And that's why there is hope in what he is trying to do when he moves to renewable energy. But the poverty dimension, I believe, is absolutely key. On the five dimensions that Per Esmond mentioned, the, the fundamental turnarounds. He put up the five and then he put COVID in the middle. But you forgot war, Per Esmond. The devastation of war. I believe that it is underestimated what extraordinary dev devastation war is having. If it is in the Tigray province in Ethiopia, where six million people are caught between fighting armies, armies hadn't it been for Ukraine, this uh, would, would have been or should have been on top of every agenda. So war is destructive in any manner. It is hurting each of these dimensions, not least women. Women are suffering from poverty, from conflict, and from environmental de degradation. We have to put that into, into context. Now, uh, what, what will this mean? Seen, seen from my uh, perspective. I, I will mention a couple of dimensions which I simply will you know, put into our debate. From the point of departure that I support your agenda. I think, I think you have chosen the right turnarounds. The question is then, of course, how do we do it? And it is not being, I haven't read the book, but I believe it is not being addressed in the presentation. Namely, what kind of political system do you need to change? Inside the country, but also between countries. And I happen to believe that although we have some um, <coughs> tendency of being starstruck in, in, in liberal democracies when we see authoritarian regimes because they just fix things, and there's a leader and they can set agenda and they just do it, but that's not the reality because underneath authoritarian totalitarian regimes there is deep insecurity. And I think what we saw on stage in China over this weekend can give some indications. So I think, you know, democracy, having that at, at the basis and also having it work between countries is a prerequisite for moving forward. You can debate that, well, it hasn't worked thus far, but I believe if we don't do it that way, there's no way we can succeed to have the buy-in. But two dimensions which I would like to mention. Inequality. And Jürgen said you should tax the rich. Well, come on board, Jürgen, it's not easy. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> and what we are doing is pretty fair. Because we are basically saying that, you know, we should continue uh, a development in, in our country where you have to pay for using, you know, grundrente is not about the rent. It's about you pay for using land. You pay for using resources. And if you have extraordinary surpluses, you have to share some of that in a very equitable way. But look at you know, what you face when you do that in a country where there is relative uh, uh, equality. But absolutely, this is right. I believe what I, I find inspiration of saying they are not really poor and rich countries, but they are poor and rich in countries. So the greatest inequity you may have in poor countries, whereas in richer countries you may have greater uh, kind of equity, which simply proves to me that pro preserving this main idea of the Scandinavian model of having equitable societies is key. And I believe, as OECD and IMF and World Bank and World Economic Forum are saying, inequity is poison for, 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 for change. Where you have inequity at large scale, societies simply don't change. So we, it has to be fought. I will not go into borrowing or printing money, but I, but I think that fair taxation is key. And we have to remind in the Norwegian debate that the welfare state has to be funded. It cannot be funded by the oil fund. It doesn't work like that. Oil fund is for future pensions and for some use in the budget. But, but, but well, modern welfare states has to be financed by fair taxation. And we can do that. And that is within reach. We can do that without a major turnaround. But we see right now that that is a major political struggle and we have to be ready to take it. My second element in, in the minutes that I have is on energy transition. And Jürgen said that we have to shift workers from platforms to clean energy. I agree, and we are on the way of doing that. And let's, let's try to be a bit optimistic in this. I have discussed with others that someti sometimes that maybe we will look back at these early 20s and say, it was such a paradox time. Because we really feared that how can we 
move away from the fossil? How can we afford the transition? Well, we now start to see that within our grasp, there will be abundance of renewable energy available at an affordable cost. Solar, wind, leading to hydrogen, blue or green, it is really now within the grasp. And the paradox of the Ukrainian war is that it is pushing that transition even faster. We have to do it by 2030 and by 2050, but now we really have to do it if you want to free yourself from Russian gas. But if we are going to do that, we have to do it in a way which is, I would say, ambitious and, re and realistic. And two observations on that. Gas will be needed for quite some time. In Europe, and when I talk to African colleagues, they are saying you are doing a gas dis discrimination against us because we too will need gas as a transitional stable energy source as we feed in more solar, wind and renewables. If you don't have something which is you know, guaranteed and is there, you cannot go for the renewable because you will, will be vulnerable for the days when there is no wind and no sun. And then the key comes, where, where can Norway make a difference? And, and I, 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 this will sum up a bit of my, my reflection. We have for 20 years been pioneers in carbon capture and storage not without risk. From time to time, when I need inspiration of the big picture, I may talk to some of these gentlemen, but I also call another author, Johan Rockström, and I, I tell him, Johan, talk to me for an hour. What is the big picture? What, what, what are the challenges? And what he has told me at every occasion is that there is no way we can reach 2050. There is no diagram that can bring us there if we don't succeed in capturing CO2 and storing it safely. One thing is to do it from gas, but for the hard to abate industries, be it cement or waste, they can reduce emissions, but they can never get rid of them. So they have to find the method of getting the CO2 out of the activity and having it deposited not in the atmosphere, but somewhere safe. We know how to do that. We went into that in the early 90s when we taxed the oil platforms for flaring gas, and by that incentive, we had the first attempt to store CO2 2,000 meters under the seabed. And then came, you will know, Norwegian uh, friends in, in the audience, when Jens Stoltenberg said, let us do our moon landing project. And that has been ridiculized because it really didn't succeed, did it? Well, if it hadn't been for that, we wouldn't have been where we are now almost ready to do it, because what we succeeded in that project was to capture. We did not succeed commercially to store. <coughs> but by what we did at Mongstar, we, we developed different methodologies of capturing CO2. And last week I was at Øygarden, outside Bergen, for this major site where the world will have its first complete value chain of receiving CO2 by ship, having 100 kilometers of pipeline out to a site in the North Sea, 3,000 meters under the seabed, it can be safely deposited. And the first project of the long ship Northern Light will get CO2 from cement production in Breivik, CO2 from waste plant outside Oslo, and CO2 from Yara fertilizer production in the Netherlands. And when I was in London in May, I witnessed that uh, the major waste plant in London are committing, pre-committing, in a letter of intent, one and a half million tons to do the same. So, here is at least an attempt to move forward and connect those dots, and I will finish by that. You know, Norway will strive to reach our climate goals by 2030. But Norway will make no difference in itself. We are small. So we can either do it in a way which looks good on paper, or we can do it in a way which looks good on paper and makes a difference globally. And this is the way. Because if we can prove that we have a model for CCS, if we can prove that we can build ocean wind based on the workers who built the oil platforms, that can be done in Vietnam. That can be done in Indonesia. Vietnam is considering building 50 coal-fired plants. Or should they do offshore wind solar? They are in this tipping uh, discussion and we should be there and say do the renewable thing and we can assist you if there is some gaps to close on finance or some gap gaps to be filled on 
skills, competence, engineers, putting it together, we can do that. So, you know, I take your message. I remain optimist and encouraged that we can succeed in doing this. It will be hard work, but that's why we are here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jonas. Um, the government perspective is obviously so hugely important when discussing the facilitation and implementation of major societal shifts. So thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Now, Jonas, you will stay here with us as part of our panel uh, to discuss these interesting challenges and opportunities further and here joining us. Also are then Jorgen Randes and Anders Wikman. My first question actually goes then to you, Jorgen. Mm -hmm. The Earth for All project highlights the need to address inequality as a key to unlock food and energy transformation. Can you elaborate a little more on why this is so important? Uh, I pre I'm, I'm still taped, yes. no, whatever you call it. Uh, uh, I would like to start by saying, who do you think wrote the moon landing speech for Stoltenberg in 2007? <laughs> The, the, the second thing, which I, I, I was... Did, did you have to say that? We, we know that. <laughs> of course. I, mean, I was the chair of the Lavert Ships Utvalge, yes. and of course, this was the major recommendation that was ridiculed by absolutely everyone else. And sad to... Okay, fine. The, 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 the second thing is that, yes, there is need to be realistic. Yes, you cannot move faster than the short term voters. You know, so you need political support in order to move. And yes, you cannot run a society without energy. You know, so that I agree. And yes, we need carbon capture and storage on Norwegian fossil gas in order to demonstrate how the world is going to move from here to 2080, you know, with rapidly uh, falling uh, emissions. Why is inequality important, it is because if you have an inequal, inequal society, you don't manage to get any of these decisions passed. You know, because then people, unless you have a very uh, fair and equitable solution to who should pay the bill, you know, you will not get the support. And finally, I strongly support Jonas in, I've been a member of the Labour Party since 1972, I think that the ideological base of social democracy, particularly in Norway, has been, you know, it's exactly the same as what is needed in the world in order to get the Earth for All recommendations implemented fast. But first, one has to start with inequality. Inequality does not disappear through trickle down. You know, you need active redistribution to get there. And you need it to. To, to build trust in society. And without trust, you cannot deal with the long-term issues. People will then be concerned only about the short term. So, so I think that, that, that that's a given. If I may add one thing, uh, we only had four minutes. And that's why <laughs> none of us mentioned the Ukraine war. And I thank you for doing that. And, and other wars as well. Uh, and of course, the, the big challenge now for governments is how to address the short-term crisis, which is linked to the war in Ukraine in terms of energy supplies, energy prices, food supplies, food prices, food insecurity in Africa, etc., and do it in a way that you do not block the long-term risks that we face, where climate change is, of course, one of them. So, so that, that is really, really a challenging task for, for governments. I think the European Commission so far has done a good job. But you can see that Europe mm. is, is, they are not in agreement, all of them. Uh, Orban has his policy. The new prime minister of Italy has her policy. We have gotten a government in Sweden this week that I'm afraid has not the policy that we prescribe here today. 
So, so it's, it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a fight. Uh, and I think Norway can, can, <laughs> can help us because, because you, you also offer solutions. And I very much agree on us that, that if we only try to fix our own sort of emission agenda without thinking about the rest of the world, that is to say, if we don't pr provide solutions that other can copy and, and take after, mm -hmm. we have not done the job. So, so I, I, I believe that's very good. Finally, you touched upon materials because you said cement, steel, etc. There are emissions and they cannot be totally eliminated. We hope by uh, producing steel using hydrogen that most of the carbon dioxide emissions will go away. But Sweden is 5 million tons. The world production is 1,700 million tons. So it will take a long time. So we need these kind of solutions. And I would add, we need to look for substitution. You can build, uh, build, you can build infrastructure in wood. You don't need steel and cement. And I think wood substitution is going to be a major issue in the years to come. Jonas, would you like to comment on what Jürgen and Anders were saying before I pose you my next question? Well, I, I, I will simply say that I believe that these big connecting the dots approaches are necessary because you need to see how things are related. Absolutely. And then the question is, how do you take that from an inspiration and put it into action? And there, that's where I think everybody has to uh, have a little meditation. You know, what can I do? Where am I placed? Uh, what is in within my reach of, of, of being a business leader, working at a site, being a politician? Uh, that's, again, why I salute Per Espen. I think he, b he uses his skills to, to, to operate in an arena which is absolutely key, academic, teaching the people. Uh, but what I really... So, my, my point here is that in order to make this change in time, I believe we have to be strategic and secure change at the different sites where it can inspire others to say, well, this is something which is worthwhile trying. And, you know, I, I sense we are moving into a new COP in Sharm el Sheikh in a couple of weeks. And you may say, well, it's worse than ever uh, with these COPs. But there's a tendency, as I hear it when I talk to colleagues, when I appointed uh, a minister of climate and, and energy and, and environment, what kind of personality did I want for that? Well, I chose somebody who I knew was a good diplomat who could work, you know, operationally out there. So uh, Espen Bart Eide, uh, who has been able to come from Norway at platforms where we could tilt balances in the right direction, such as we did on plastics in, in Nairobi a few months mm -hmm. ago. Uh, the tendency I see is that there is a, if it is from, you know, from John Kerry or from India or from some of the emerging countries, is to say, let, let us really focus on very concrete projects where we have changed within reach. I, I think that is at least something which we should salute and welcome. Because if, for example, India can, can, can prove that it can successfully embark on this renewable uh, strategy, it can, it, they can get more energy to uh, a country that needs to take new steps out of poverty. Uh, uh, we can make a major inroads on the, on the major emissions. You know, when I speak to John Kerry, as I do quite frequently, he is saying, you know, here are 20 different sites in the world where we need to make a change. Mm -hmm. Can we? make a project for each of them. You probably can't, but you have to be ambitious for each of them and, and connect people. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like this uh, Vietnam example, you know, should they do the coal fire plants? It's all available, it's technology, they have investors, or should we do the other one, which is probably uh, more interesting? Can we demonstrate for Croatia, when they make moves, small country in Europe, that if they do this successfully, their industry can have a very interesting market in the Balkans? Yes, I think they can. Mm. So uh, when, when I move to go to Sharm el Sheikh, you know, one big project which is emerging there is Scaltex project of solar, where Egypt, for all its defaults, will try to be leading on hydrogen, major solar electricity production that can lead to hydrogen production and then be, you know, an interesting source for, for, uh, for, uh, trans for heavy transport. And that's why I also, you know, the paradox of the Ukrainian war is that our agenda with Europe during the last six months has completely shifted. Because now they want to do CCS, hydrogen, blue car carbon, green carbon, the, what is uh, 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 hydrogen, 
what is developing around the North Sea as a potential grid for offshore wind, major potential. So that's why I think, you know, as I said, in a few years, we will look back at these years and say, you know, imagine that we were really in time of shortage, but we may come to something which is abundance, which is not easy. It will be very complicated because it will challenge power structures uh, in the world, obviously. Now, Jonas, I'm going to turn to you still uh, a bit about the question that we actually asked um, Jürgen here in the beginning, but a bit about inequality still. And, and you mentioned in your speech here about the rich minority. And, uh, but the question is then, how do we actually get the rich minority to help finance the increased well-being for the majority? Well, if, in, if inequality does not develop too deep, you can do it because there's a basic foundation in society that this is good for all. You don't tax the rich to punish the rich. I don't like that language. But you have fair and equitable taxation, which is improving trust and life equality for all. It is not in the interest of people who are well off to build big fences and have security people around their houses because they are insecure. But it, 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 it will be based on a social contract that this is fair and it is fair for all. That is why we have a universal health system, for example, which you may argue, why should people who are well off be offered free hospital treatment? Why couldn't they pay a bit? They can. But the fact that we have it is that we all feel we have a share in that model. Mm. So, you know, I, I don't believe you can take, for example, the, the, the Nordic welfare state model and say you can just transport it and export it, because it's really built on culture and history. But there are elementary lessons in this, which I think can be shared. Uh, and I can only speak, you know, fr from, from, from our perspective. But, but you mentioned the, the, the World Health Organization working on economics and health. This was something we started when Dr. Brundtland and I were at WHO. We had the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health, led by Jeffrey Sachs, that basically pointed out what most health officials knew that uh, uh, in wise investment in health is good for the economy. And our approach was that, you know, you don't need to convince the health minister, but this is a lesson you need to bring to presidents and prime ministers and finance ministers, that this is the right thing to do to make your economy grow. And I think it's the same thing we need to do on inequality and on equity and on, you know, these climate change investments, demonstrate and document that this is also and that, and, that, and that equality really pays off. It, 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 it is a wise investment in making the big change. And as they say, again, at the OECD, inequality is poison for change. Yeah. So, Anders, I'm going to turn to you. And actually, Jonas, you mentioned not about building walls, and I can mention that Finland is actually going to build a wall that has been decided. There is going to be a wall against Russia. That's a fact now that they have approved, in fact, building a wall or building a fence. That's, that's, a, that's an interesting question now that's, that's come mm. up. But Anders, I'm going to turn to you uh, because as the Swedish speaking Finn, I actually wonder how would you describe the situation across the border from us here in Norway, in Sweden? So what is the government doing to make turnarounds happen in Sweden? It would have been easier if I had been <laughs> here a couple of months ago, because then we had had the government that had been in place for seven, eight years. Now we have a brand new government, which is a coalition backed up by a right-wing nationalistic party with more than 20% of the vote. We don't know where we are going. They have presented a, a program, which I'm not a supporter of, uh, it's a very inhuman program when it comes to migration and asylum seekers. Of course, the background is that we have been quite bad at integrating people coming to Sweden. So, so we, have, we have a depth there. So I, I can see the rationale for some of the suggestions, but they are, in my opinion, not coming from the spirit of a humanitarian uh, sort of uh, mind or, 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 or humanism. Um, it's also, to my knowledge, difficult now to say much about their climate policy. Uh, unfortunately, they are going to cut foreign aid by 15% uh, the first year and maybe even more. 
Um, and you know, we have been proud like Norway to be about 1% for, for decades. And you can say, why should we do that when others only commit 0.3 or 0.5%? Well, somebody has to do it and we are, we are rich enough to do it. Uh, and one of the points we are making in Earth for All is that unless we redistribute wealth, and we have benefited so grossly from raw materials from the South for decades, if not centuries. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's fair to do it. Then you could say foreign aid, development cooperation, sometimes is not effective. Of course, you are working in very different uh, circumstances or situations. But, but I think that NORAD, CEDA, etc., we have, we have a quite good track record. So, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not too optimistic in the short term about Sweden. So that, that's why we need Norway to push, push our government a bit. Unfortunately, we're running out of time here, but I would like to one challenge you with one question still. One concrete action that you think we should start doing now to make the giant leap happen. And one quick answer. Jorgen, Anders, and Jonas. So what Jonas should do in Egypt is to further the idea that we need to use fossil gas for the next 40, 50 years, but in order to combine it with decent temperatures, we need to decarbonate the, this one through Norwegian CCS. And that is absolutely necessary in addition to uh, moving electricity from fossil to renewable fuels. This is technically doable. It costs 30% more than the uh, dirty stuff. It's doable. And we could lead the way by paying you know, for part of the development cost. One of the suggestions that we make in Earth for All is something called universal basic dividend. And Jonas, you were touching upon it because you said if you extract resources from the earth, from the commons, or if you benefit from a financial infrastructure, or if you benefit from the internet as a company, and you earn large revenues and profits, you should pay, you should pay uh, a dividend to a fund that would then be distributed equally to the people of the world. And we have made some calculations that if this was done today based on the kind of extraction we see, based on the internet, based on finance, a family of four in Kenya or in Uganda or wherever could benefit from four to five thousand dollars a year as an extra income. That would mean a lot. And it would be fair, because why should a mining company take all the riches for themselves? It's, it's part of our common heritage. So I think this only universal basic dividend is a very interesting example. And we have really to disseminate that idea and, and make, it, make, it, make it real. And the last word to you, Jonas, please. Well, uh, in Glasgow, when we just, you know, I had been prime minister for three weeks, we, we doubled our climate fin finance pledge. And so that's something we have to stand by, you know, that we will uh, step that up to 2026. Uh, and I will reiterate that uh, in, in Cairo. Then I would say, you know, this is, I mean, you are the economist, Jürgen, but I would say we have to tax CO2. We have to tax CO2. Yeah. And we have to reach, I mean, Europe has the, the ambition of reaching 2,000 crowns per, uh, per ton. We are increasing CO2 taxation in our budget this year by 21%, which is a kind of a clear track towards 2030 of, of, of scaling up. And, um, it, it, uh, it creates change, because when you, when you travel around Norway now and you visit companies, they say, you know, we are starting seriously to consider how we can change gas with hydrogen in this industrial production, and we can cut 800,000 tons mm -hmm. and 1.5 million tons. And if you put that together, we are almost there. So we have to make it work. And, and you know, my, my scene is, is the Norwegian scene. And on, on development, I, I agree with you, it is, it is key. I think we still have to work with uh, partners in the UN to make development cooperation strategic. Because development money, you know, we are not reaching 1% uh, 
in our budget next year in our proposal because we have a budget, we have a GDP increase which is very steep. So if we were going to live by 1%, we would have to increase our development budgets by one third. So we maintain the high level we have out of 2022. But Norway, I can show you, will do its part to, uh, to maintain that high activity and to do it in a way that will leverage more resources coming out from development banks, from the private sector. I think, you know, where we really have to be, be, be innovative in thinking is how we can mobilize private money mm. and how we can do that. Because people say, you know, there's enough money around, but that is not, not exactly right. I mean, if you have a value chain for hydrogen, which is completely mature and developed, well, then the private money will come as it does in the internet now, but it did not come to the internet at the initial stage. So I think in Europe and globally, you would need state money, which can be put yeah. forward at, at, at commercial terms in the sense that you have long-term loans mm -hmm. at a reasonable interest rate, but, but, but that no private sector would do on its own. But if that gets off the ground, you will leverage money from philanthropy and from private sector. And, and here I believe, you know, that, uh, that Europe and, and, and countries like Norway can, can make a difference in the financial system. Mm -hmm. So now time is running out. Thank you to all. <laughs>